So by 1962, there's a lot of problems. Production has gone down. Corruption has increased. Morale had declined. People who had believed in the Communist Party, who thought it would be the savior of China, are now starting to question that. In 1962, at a party meeting, Liu Xiaoqi, there on the right, will criticize the Great Leap Forward, say this was a terrible idea, and will also criticize Mao Zedong, right, the leader of China, the leader of the Communist Party. And so what will happen is there will be a program to clean up corruption, to purge the party of people who behaved badly during the Great Light Leap Forward, and get back to this policy of gradual economic development. So you look at this and you can say, okay, good. You know, the Great Leap Forward is a disaster, but under Liu Xiaoqi, you know, the, the party has realized that there's a problem. They're taking steps to address it. They're going to clean up the corruption in their party. They're going to get back to this kind of road of gradual economic development. It may not make development fast enough, but it's the best alternative because this whole rapid development thing does not work. So Mao Zedong then is kind of pushed to the side, right? Mao Zedong is kind of pushed to the side. And he's afraid. He's very much concerned that eventually Liu Xiaoqi will replace him completely, will become the leader of the uh, China completely, and the, com the total leader of the Communist Party, and then will later denounce him. And that Mao Zedong will be remembered historically as a failure. And that's not something that Mao wants, right? So Mao has been pushed to the margins. Liu Xiaoqi is now basically in charge of China, but Mao, Mao still has some power and he would like to get back into full power, and he's not happy with uh, Liu Xiaoqi. Mao is an extraordinarily uh, wily politician, extraordinarily smart guy, and he will essentially form an alliance with the uh, army and use the army to promote his ideas. And you can kind of see this idea here in this poster. It says, warriors love reading Chairman Mao's books. An alliance with the army is a really good idea. And Mao is famous for saying that power grows from the barrel of a gun, right? Power grows from the barrel of a gun. So Mao understood that fundamentally, whoever controls the army, when push comes to shove, they have power. So he's been pushed out of uh, total power in 1962. He's on the margins, but he's slowly building up for a comeback. One thing I think is fascinating is how Mao stages his comeback. He's built up a base in the military, and then 1966, he's going to go for a swim. They say, how does a swim lead to a comeback? Well, Mao leads a lot of people in the swim. You can see that on the right. Uh, there he is uh, having towed off, and you can see all these people in boats and in the water. But uh, he led a lot of people in a swim in a major river that has a powerful current. Uh, and he did this because he was in his early 70s, and he wanted to show that he was still healthy enough to lead. And that he was still a powerful, strong, intelligent leader. Right. And this then is going to help lead to his comeback. Right. He shows he now has an alliance with the military. He has shown that he is a healthy leader. And many people still look up to him, see him as a great leader. And Mao will use this power to launch what is called the Cultural Revolution. What I think is fascinating is this, is that Mao does not look back at the Great Leap Forward and says, you know what, I made a mistake, this whole revolutionary fervor thing, you know, I don't think it works the way I think it does, I need to change things. Rather, he argues that the problem was not with the Great Leap Forward itself, he argues that the problem was the revolution was not radical enough he argued that the revolution was not deep enough. He argued that instead you needed to have radical reform of all of society and the party. He argued that now the party was not, the Communist Party, I mean, was not part of the solution. He's now arguing that the Communist Party was part of the problem. Right? So you need a radical reform of society and the party to bring rapid change and development. And Mao in particular was angry at those people in the, in the Communist Party like Liu Xiaoqi who had criticized him. And this will give him the opportunity to punish them and prevent them from threatening his position. So Mao 
and his supporters, there's people, Mal has a lot of supporters, will call, or rather will criticize party leaders and call for young people to do the same. Right, Mao and his supporters will criticize party leaders and call for young people to do the same. A, a constant statement during this time period is, it is right to rebel. And this will lead to widespread attacks on authority and tradition. And I love this poster here because it gives you really a sense of what the Cultural Revolution was about, right? Uh, the Chinese there on top says, destroy the old world, or that can also be read as society, uh, create a new world, right? And you can see there the act of destruction that needs to preclude creation. Uh, if You can see there's a young man there, and this Cultural Revolution was really focused on the youth in particular, uh, especially people born after liberation, right? People born after 1949. And you can see there he's he's smashing uh, dice, a radio, or I'm sorry, a record player, a statue of Buddha, and a crucifix, right? We're destroying this old world of religious superstition and of bourgeoisie comfort. And we're going to embrace a new world based around these youth who, because of their youth, because of their uh, idealism, are the ones who can really change things. And I like this image because I think it really illustrates, in a sense, what was going on here, right? In this image, you can see a group of young people, mostly, punishing older people, right? Uh, there's young people here punishing older people, punishing people who had been in authority over them. And so this kind of topsy-turvy uh, world, in a sense, in China at this time. And what's particularly striking about this, remember, a lot of these people who are being punished were members of the Communist Party, had been people uh, in authority. The young people, when they were told to rebel, were typically in school, were either high school, middle school, or college students. So when they rebelled, their first targets were their teachers, were their principals. And you can imagine, you know, imagine that if you're in high school and you're suddenly told by the leader of the country that it's right to rebel, you can go after those teachers. And especially teachers who abuse their authority, they're going to be in a lot of trouble. And they can be public humiliate, publicly humiliated, like what's going on here. Uh, and at times they would be even tortured and killed. And of course, this rebellion against authority will include the head, essentially, of China at this time, Liu Xiaoqi. Remember, Mao had been pushed from power, in a sense, to the margins by Liu Xiaoqi and by his criticism of the Great Leap Forward. Now, Mao can get revenge because Liu is the guy in power. Mao is saying rebel against even the party. He's the head, right? So Liu Xiaoqi will be rebelled against. He will be purged from the party and will suffer so much that he will eventually die from his mistreatment. And there you can see Lu Xiaoqi being surrounded by young people who are criticizing him and shaking little red books at him. What's in those little red books? Why the sayings of Chairman Mao Zedong. Right? So Mao was able to successfully use the Cultural Revolution to get rid of Lu Xiaoqi, not only politically, but get rid of him from this world itself. And on the right, they you can see those pet, uh, those uh, there's these other uh, young people, these red guards, as we'll talk about momentarily, who are punishing Lu's wife. Uh, Lu Xiaoqi's wife, Wang Guiming, was herself a member of the party, was herself an official, and she will also be purged. Uh, the show won't be driven to her death. She will be publicly humiliated. Uh, she's meant to be dressed up there like a prostitute. Uh, and the, the Red Guards force her to dress that way to humiliate her. But you can see this allows Mao to get revenge on his enemies by encouraging this kind of rising against the party itself. And this is in a certain degree organized. Uh, there are groups of people who do this. And they are called Red Guards. And remember, red is the color associated with communism. And in particular, communism is associated, or I should say correct communism is associated with Mao Zedong. So these people are guards of communism, which means protecting Mao and making sure his ideas are implemented. And you can see in that poster, you have this represent, uh, representations of these powerful young people, both men and women. And the poster there says, it is no crime to revolt 
and there is no guilt in rebellion. And this is what Mao is teaching. This is what Mao is saying. He's saying it is right to rebel. Not to rebel against Mao, of course, but every other authority, it's okay to rebel against. Students, rebel against your teachers. Rebel against your parents. Rebel against the party. The party is rotten. It needs to be cleansed by your idealism. And one thing that's fascinating about this, in 1966, students are given free travel, right? So if you're a student, you can get on a train and go anywhere you want in China and you have to pay nothing. And you'll even be given pocket money. You're expected to pay it back later, but you just a lot of people just use fake names when they signed, up, signed in to get the money and so they never had to pay it back. And you're not to be punished. You can do what you want, right? You can do what you want. You, you hear that there's some uh, old man in, in his apartment and he is a counter-revolutionary and he has uh, bad books, books that criticize communism. You can go in there into his house, ransack his house. And that's a good thing, not a bad thing. Right? You want to go beat up some people who uh, are counter-revolutionaries? Go right on ahead. You're not going to be punished for it. In fact, you'll be praised. And this will, at times, really go off the rails. One thing to give you an example about was that there were attacks on flower shops. Flowers were declared bad because growing flowers uh, was a bourgeoisie uh, kind of sign of decadence. And flowers, well, that resources that are used to grow as flowers, that could be used to grow food. So flowers are bad. Goldfish ponds are bad because it's a waste of money to have a goldfish pond. Cats are bad, right? And there were actually, in the city of Shanghai, there was an anti-cat campaign where people went around killing cats because cats were seen as a sign of middle-class decadence. Uh, and there was also war raged on racing pigeons, uh, a lot of people kept uh, pigeons and raced them, and uh, which I think is cool. As an aside, in China, people take birds on walks, which I think is cool. They, I mean, the birds in a cage, but they will actually take their bird on a walk. Because birds are good pets, uh, but they need to go out too. So people will walk their birds, which is awesome. But in this period of China, racing pigeons were considered bad. And as I said before, the Red Guards could come into your home and could tear it up looking for anything that might mark you as an enemy of communism. And sometimes, I mean, they know they're not going to be punished. Sometimes they just steal stuff. They come in your house. They take your money. They take anything that's valuable. And what's particularly striking during this time period is the destruction of cultural properties. Libraries were ransacked. And books that were hundreds of years old were destroyed. Ancient temples, Buddhist temples, were destroyed. The tombs of Catholic priests who had died in China were destroyed. Famous churches were destroyed. Mosques were destroyed. Anything that seemed to represent the old world was destroyed. There was actually an attempt to destroy the uh, hometown kind of uh, all the different uh, at uh, Chufu, where Confucius is from. There was all these attempts to destroy the shrines to him and all the different graves of his descendants. And uh, these were largely unsuccessful, which I'm, I'm thankful for. The, the, they were able to defend a lot of the Confucian shrines from the, the, the wrath of these Red Guards. What's really astounding is that the Red Guards eventually would turn on each other. right? The Red Guards would eventually turn on each other in factional struggles to see which one was the most loyal to Mao and which one should be the ones that would create the new society and run it, right? So we'll go from this idea of a right to rebellion against authority to conflict between the Red Guards, which almost leads to a civil war. And eventually Mao has to call in the army to put all this down. What then do you do with all these young people? with these former Red Guards. Well, they're going to be sent down, a lot of them, to learn from the countryside, and they're called sent down youth. About 15 to 20 million students, principally former Red Guards, after this factional struggle is put down, are gonna be sent down to the countryside, right? And they're told you're going here to learn. You're gonna learn how to be good communists by learning from the peasants. And like I said, this is a huge number of people, 15 to 20 million. The reality, though, was they were essentially just being used for labor, right? Uh, they were told they were learn to be learning from the countryside, but they were essentially just being sent to the countryside, often to very inhospitable places, 
where there had not been proper, um, you know, lodgings created for them or any kind of uh, support for them. They're just sent down and they're just expected to work hard. And imagine if you're a, a college student or a high school student, especially from, from a relatively privileged background, and now all of a sudden you're expected to do hard agricultural work, how difficult that would be. But also what makes this really, really bad has to do with the registration system in China. In China, there is a people are classified as either being urban dwellers or rural dwellers, and this continues up to this day. You want to be an urban dweller because you get a lot of benefits. You get some, some uh, more access to housing and education and so forth. A lot of these Red Guards, these former students, were registered as urban dwellers. But when they were sent down the countryside, there was an effort to reclassify them as rural dwellers, which would mean that they would lose all those benefits. They would basically have to live out their lives in the countryside away from their families. And on the right, there's a picture of two young ladies who were part of a massive hunger strike protesting this. And basically, the government wanted to move them out of the cities into the countryside because they had caused trouble when Mao Zedong had told them to cause trouble. Um, but also because there were too many people in the cities, they wanted more people in the countryside working in agriculture. And so some of them will just have to stay in the countryside. Others will eventually be able to return. But I just have to highlight here, this is, this is kind of the problem with a totalitarian system. And this is one reason why I don't like Mao Zedong. And I hope you'll excuse me, I'm going to go on a little bit of a rant here. But I have to highlight this. I, I have to make sure that, the, the, that these facts, I think, are clear. Mao, uh, well, initially, remember, we talked about how the peasants had been told that they would be given land. They were given land, but that land was taken away from them. The land still really hasn't been given back. Basically, it's been loaned back to the peasants, but it has been given back. So that's a problem. But these young students were told by Mao, who they thought really cared for them, that they should rebel, that they were the ones who would build a new China to build a new society. So their idealism was taken advantage of. Right? They were told, you're going to build a new China. It's right to rebel. Do these things. It's good. When they became a problem, and when Mao no longer needed them, they had already humiliated the Communist Party, the people that Mao didn't like. They're not needed anymore. Fine, send them to the countryside. Right? They're being punished for doing what the government told them to do. Right? Mao being the head of the government. And like I said, their youthful idealism was taken advantage of. So this is why I'm not a particularly big fan of Mao Zedong, because he was quite happy, even though he claimed to be working for the good of the people, he didn't seem much to care about people. And I think he thought about people as an abstract. To put it one way, I think Mao cared about the people, but I don't think he cared about people as in terms of individual human beings. And he could just callously allow this to happen to these young people, 15 to 20 million of them, who had faithfully followed him and tried to do what he asked them to do. Mao then will die in 1976, and that will lead to a new page in Chinese history, right? And that's why I have this section ending in the 1970s, because after Mao's death, his successors had to figure out, where do we go from here, right? Where do we go from here?